Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. Welcome to another Western Philosophy Short, in which rather than walk through a long, dense, and complicated text in a linear manner, we simply cut to the chase and try to ask, okay, what was really the significance of a particular thinker, like in the case of this week, not just Heidegger, not just later Heidegger, but uh, the kind of later Heideggerian thought you find in poetry, language, thought. Now, this is a notoriously difficult book to read, even by Heideggerian standards, because whereas Zion Insight is at least something like a standard Western philosophical treatise. That is to say, uh, Being in Time is a big book that continues one line of thought from start to finish and is kind of still within the realm of the concerns of Western philosophers, um, even though it's deconstructing the very notion of a subject understanding the object, uh, which is really the Cartesian problem of how does the mind work. Obviously, that book is deconstructing that, but it's still giving us something like an account of, okay, well, when you are approaching... Um, the object as an object in the explicit sense of the term, that is to say something you're trying to understand on a theoretical level through staring at it and basically doing something like science on it. Um, that is something which you can do, but only in the deficient mode of treating it as merely present at hand. Otherwise, you're engaged with it as, say, equipment that is being used in a referential totality of so many other involvements, in which case it's ready at hand. Now, obviously, he's deconstructing the Cartesian problem, but he's still providing something like a response. When you are doing the Cartesian thing, that's what you're really doing. Well, um, in the later work like this, Poetry Language Thought, um, you really don't find even those uh, sort of traditional questions being formulated. Instead, this book deals with a lot of stuff which would not even seem, <laughs> obviously, to be concerns of Western philosophy at all. These are essays on very obscure topics, like, say, building, dwelling, and the question of whether language, not in the scientific sense of, say, linguistics, not in the fully rational sense of logic, but rather language in the poem, is something which has to be presupposed before any of these other philosophical questions even can be formulated. Now, part of this obviously goes back to Heidegger's understanding that when you use the terms of traditional um, Western philosophy like subject and substance and essence and accident, it might seem perfectly natural to assume that all of these are timeless ahistorical, and eternally valid. It's simply objectively, there we're using that word again, um, the case that all of these substances not only refer to things with a valid existence in the real world, but that they all fit together into this little system in which you're explicitly treating these as um, so many elements of jargon, which make up an ordered set of relations to one another, which we really get from the ideas of someone like Aristotle, but over millennia of uh, having it uh, overused and therefore having us naturalized to it, we simply take for granted that this is a reflection of the order of reality itself. Well, Heidegger's project was largely to show that these terms which we use as jargon um, actually go back to not even the Greek thought of Aristotle himself, but rather to Latin translations, which are a little different from the original terms in Greek themselves. But more problematic yet is the fact that we don't translate those Latin terms into English. We simply transliterate them into our language, in which case they don't mean anything to us within language itself, except what their role within that artificial system of notions allows them to hold. And this is different. This is to be contrasted with the way that ordinary language works, which is why Heidegger himself in that book, Sein und Zeit, did not fall back on such terms, but rather, um, I wouldn't even say he invented his own terminology. Rather, he allowed the German language to speak when he was trying to talk about that which is ready at hand or present at hand. Um, he simply used the words within German, which allow that to be revealed or manifested. And this is radicalized in the later work, even to the point that the kind of treatment of being, for example, that you have in Sein und Zeit is still seen as too close to that ideal of a, um, a historical and timeless and eternally valid um, model for how that would always work. Instead, in the later Heidegger, you have this big emphasis on history 
and specifically the idea of a set of different historical eras in which being meant something rather different in the Greek era, specifically like the ideal of the pre-Socratics, being still means something like thusis, which is like an untranslatable term. We transliterate it to our own detriment into the word physics or physical, despite the fact that that's really not at all what thusis in ancient Greek means, our notion of the merely physical. Um, so uh, you have the the pre-Socratic ideal of thusis, and you have these great pre-Socratic philosophers who are still able to talk about that, which become a big concern for Heidegger and also Gadamer. But then you have, um, debatably, there's four. Then you also have something of a shift with Plato, right? But uh, really, the next really big shift for Heidegger is in the medieval era. Now you no longer see beings as a thusis. You rather see them as creations because there's a difference in the notion of being itself between God, who is the creator, his kind of being is simply unlike the kind of being of all of us, which is that we are creations. And this allows us to have presuppositions about the very notion of being that are hardwired into religious sort of presuppositions, even when we are trying to be perfectly objective, timeless, and ahistorical in our treatment of the subject. You can see how this is a problem. And then with uh, modernity, um, you have another shift still in which uh, beings seem to be defined in terms of the kind of objects understood as images, which can be spelled out in the sort of um, detail of a Cartesian idea. We keep in mind that for Descartes, an idea is really something like a picture, and beings transition from the creations of God into the kinds of objects which we can represent as those sort of Cartesian pictures, precisely because the deeper shift in our metaphysical understanding of being is now one of will to power. So something which Heidegger is very careful to note in this book is that you had to have the emphasis on will to power before you had the emphasis on the world appearing as idea. In other words, Nietzsche has to come before Descartes even, um, despite the fact that he follows later in history, because the very ability or rather the necessity to have to represent beings as the kind of ideas which can be represented as such images to the subject's mind implies that you are first standing over against the objects because the will to power is driving you to do so. In which case, we are once again talking about a kind of being which is a far from a historical or eternally valid and ultimately which has to go back to language for the his, the historicity which exposes the contingency of these terms for the later Heidegger really goes back to language because once again even when we try to use the technical terms of traditional philosophy substance essence accident we're using language but in a degraded form rather than allow language to speak as it had perhaps in the er in the earliest ways that these were formulated in the ancient era etc um, we simply use them as so many labels to stick onto things in a one-to-one -one correlation uh, between the symbol and the thing that it stands for. When we might assume that that's exactly how language is always supposed to work without realizing that even what are merely technical terms for us actually did speak in their original context. A great example of this is an atom. For us, an atom is a dry technical term which can only be defined with other dry technical terms within the system of science. But for um, ancient Greeks, atom has that negative prefix at the beginning. Eh? It means that which cannot be divided any further, that which cannot be maybe cut up any further um, because it's always already reached its indivisible unit. But that's not at all what we hear when we say the word Adam, even if language is perhaps speaking. There's a degradation not only in the speaking, but also in our ability to hear it. And Heidegger's project in the later years is largely to restore that connection, even to the point of being willing to um, delve into topics which seem unrelated to the concerns of Western philosophy, as this later collection deals with a lot of things like, say, um, building and dwelling and thinking, the a title of that essay, because interestingly, when you even talk about being um, within the confines that language allows you to, as language is kind of the first thing which allows a revelation of such meaning um, to happen in the first place, if we go back to language and talk about this mysterious notion that begins with a b, both in um, English and also other Proto-Indo-European languages, uh, excuse me, Indo-European languages in Sanskrit, there's um, two different words for be, right? There's um, pavati, bh, which is 
like our word be, and then the present tense form is, etc. That's more like the Sanskrit term asti. These were two different words in Sanskrit that became one word in English and led to confusions. But when Heidegger interrogates that version of be that begins with a B, he says, even if we don't realize it, when we, we talk about being in that sense, we're really talking about bauen in Germanic languages, which really means building today, it means building, but the kind of building it refers to isn't construction in a technological sense. Um, it isn't like the construction of a skyscraper today. No, this bowen has to do with dwelling, but dwelling is the notion of being or bowen, which we have preserved even in we don't even if we don't realize it in words like neighbor. The neighbor is the bower who is near. Our word bore, somebody who's very uncivilized. There was a real bore over for dinner the other night, uh, someone with no uh, manners because he's not civilized, villas city in French, because he's a peasant. Okay, he's the peasant who dwells near you is what your neighbor really is. We have this faint echo of a speaking long past within um, even modern English, which Heidegger is trying to restore in the sense language is still speaking, we just have to be attuned to listen to it. And what language reveals is that when we talk about being, we're talking about dwelling. Well, let me put it this way. When we talk about being, we're talking about bowing, which begins with the B, which is building, but not the construction of modern artificial technologies, rather the kind of building which has to do with the dwelling of somebody for whom things are still possible because a thing, dusting, um, itself isn't just the dry artificial term for any object whatsoever, especially an object stripped of all of its actual qualities into the empty, purely empty and unknowable object of the thing in itself for Kant. No thing actually etymologically has to do with a gathering, specifically the gathering of earth, sky, mortals, and divinities. And the one who dwells in the sense of building is the one for whom such things are still possible in the sense that such a gathering of earth, sky, mortals, and divinities is still possible um, for whom, therefore, nearness is still possible. The funny thing about modernity is we've gotten very good at um, destroying distances. You can uh, travel um, anywhere on the earth within 24 hours, right? Well, 24 hours, you can go all the way to the other side of the world, like India to America, as I've done uh, several times myself. Uh, so we feel like we've conquered distance, and yet things, despite becoming very close in a raw technological sense, I've lost their nearness because nearness is not just a short interval of physical distance between two points. Rather, nearness is something which is allowed to us by something which has to be presupposed for any of this to make sense, which is, as you may have guessed, language. There is a um, great quote from another book, On the Way to Language by Heidegger, um, where word breaks off, no thing may be. I think he's actually quoting from another German poet. Is the idea that what allows the thing to be near which in turn allows dwelling, which in turn allows building, which in turn allows being, is actually the word. Because language has to be presupposed for any of this to make sense because language for the later Heidegger is kind of the answer to what allows phenomenological givenness in the first place. The big mystery for Husserlian phenomenology, what allows givenness for the phenomenon to appear if we suspend all of our biases. We perform the phenomenological reduction in which I am no longer treating what appears as an object which I am standing over against as a subject within an extended world of other things, in which case I have metaphysical presuppositions about that and myself. No, I simply allow what appears to appear without any presuppositions to the extent that that's possible. Well, Heidegger um, later on provides a very unexpected answer to this. He says, what allows that givenness on a phenomenological level to occur is language. You have to presuppose language before any of this other philosophy. You have to allow language to speak. And where does language speak most purely? Not in the artificial systems of jargon, like the ones I've critiqued thus far, and also the ones in the man-made sciences. No, language speaks the most purely in the poem. And that is why the poetic language is what will allow the thing to be near, will allow dwelling and building and therefore being to be.